do we grow? By strength or resolve? Can we make it so? Can we shape the course of our lives according to our purpose and designs? The tender shoots that so quickly spring up must grow strong, lest they remain frail and green. Would we be overwhelmed by perils in store that his timing seeks to prepare us for? Let us endure our trials with patience, for it's in his goodness that we trust and hold fast to our commitment, resting in his faithfulness to us. His goal is for our good. On this our assurance falls, that he who began this good work will surely make it grow tall. Good morning. It is great to see you this morning. I just want to extend a warm welcome if today happens to be uh, maybe a, a first visit or the first few visits that you've been here to New Hope. I just want to say thanks for being here. Understand that, that when we come to a strange place and there are strange people, sometimes we just don't know what to expect. So I know that is not the easiest thing in the world to do. So thanks for being here. If you, if you missed Stopping at the Welcome Center on the way in, I'd love for you to stop on your way out after service. We've got a special gift for you. We'd just love for you to, to feel welcome. And later in the service, when we, we pass the offering plates around, uh, on the bottom of your bulletin, there's a communicator card. We'd love for you to fill that information out, as much information as you're, you're comfortable, because we'd love to be able to connect with you, to follow up with you, and let you know that uh, we were so thankful to see you here this morning. We are in a, a, a series, it's just a, a discipleship series. It, it started though back in August, the middle of August, Pastor Phil preached a, a message and really the message was about our vision for life groups here at New Hope. And really life groups, I believe, I believe it, it, it is our vehicle, if I can use that word, for discipleship. And so, so after he shared this, this idea of what life groups are, we, we launched into this series on discipleship. But before we, we get to today, let me just kind of catch us up. So we said life groups are about three things. We believe that the life groups are, are smaller groups of individuals that gather together to grow spiritually. And there are three things that, that happen in life group. Number one is relationships. We believe that relationships are kind of natural, that that's kind of the, the easy part of gathering together with other people. You just have conversation with one another. You get to know one another. You share coffee. You share dessert. You share a meal. And you get to know each other and you develop and build and grow in your relationship. And then let me skip, let me, let me not, not talk about the middle, let me go to the last one. The last one is multiplication. Now multiplication, we'll, we'll get to that eventually, and I know I've talked about it a little bit, but multiplication, I believe it's the, it's the call that God has on all of us as followers of Christ, that we are to, to multiply, that we are to duplicate in others what God has done in us. Right, that we don't want to keep it for ourselves, but we want to share what God has done in us with other people that don't know his son, Jesus. And so we believe that by multiplying, that we can reach more people and that more people can be a part of a smaller gathering, a smaller community where I believe that discipleship happens. And so let's, let's kind of get to discipleship here. Last week, Last week, we, we, we talked about, like, what does a discipleship do? W what do they do? And, and last week, specifically, we talked about this idea of worship, that a disciple, a disciple worships the Father. And, and we, we, we shared the story of Martha and Mary, of how Martha was just so preoccupied, so busy with her plans and her agenda and everything that she wanted to see happen, that she just completely missed that the Savior of the world was in her home and, and that she could, could just have him and the time with him at her disposal. 
but yet her sister, Mary, we find Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, just absorbing, taking in every word that Jesus taught and shared. So not only do we believe that the discipleship and those who are disciples of Jesus, that they know how to worship the Father, but we also, what we said the week prior, was is that it begins, it begins with knowing Jesus. It begins with knowing him, with believing in him. But it can't just stop there. It can't just be this head knowledge that, yeah, I know about Jesus. I know who he is. I know these wonderful things that he's done. But it has to go beyond that. We have to actually put our trust or our faith in him and actually do, actually live out what we believe about Jesus. So we can't just know him, but we have to live and do the things that Jesus calls us to do. And it doesn't just stop there, but then we, we have to be about growth. We have to be, be, be willing and intentional about growing in our, our knowledge and our understanding and our faith of him. And so we're, we're growing, but it doesn't stop there. We're also called to, to go. We're called to, to live like Jesus. And if Jesus was sent from his father, then it's a call that we have as well. We're too. We're called to be sent. We're called to be a sent people. We're called to be on mission for him. We're called to reach those who are apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we boil it all down. And we said that a disciple is one who is becoming more like Jesus. That a disciple is someone who is becoming more like Jesus. And so this morning, this morning, we're gonna get to a new topic here. And I also believe that not only, not only does a disciple know how to worship the, the Father, but a disciple is also committed to community. A disciple is committed to community. Not just any community, but a disciple is committed to Christian community. Now, what I want to do this morning is I want to answer the question, why? Like, why is it? You've probably heard people in ministry, maybe pastors, teachers, say before, well, you need to be committed to church. You need to be in church. Why have you been in church? Why have you been, been part of a, a faith community? You, maybe you've heard that. Ask, well, why is that? Why is that so important for us being a follower of Christ? Why is it so important for a disciple to be committed to a Christian community, first and foremost? First and foremost, it begins with our Heavenly Father. It begins with God. And as we look at God, God exists in community. His very nature, his very existence, God exists in community, right? Let's, look, let's just look at a few passages of scripture. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see these three intertwined, working together as part of this commission to go and make other disciples. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. You see the three components, the three pieces fitting together here in this passage. Let's look at one more. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. It says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. You all, you, you see it, you see the three components? Now, now I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and try to explain and define the, the, the Trinity. That's probably another message, a whole another series. But God exists in community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Let me, let me just read you this. It says, we believe in the one living and true God, both holy and loving, eternal, unlimited in power, wisdom, and goodness, the creator and preserver of all things. Within this unity, there are these three persons, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The three persons of one essential nature, power, and eternity. It's Father God, it's, Father the, it's, it's God the Father, it's God the Son, and it's God the Holy Spirit. He exists in this communal relationship. Number two, second, we are created, we're created in the image of God. You and I are created in God's image. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you live like it or not, you bear the image of your creator. You bear the image of God. You were created in God's image. So, so the next time you look at someone else, realize that they were created in the image of God. You yourself were created in his image. Image. And if we can jump forward to another chapter in Genesis, Genesis 2, verse 18, says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. So God creates this beautiful, this wonderful paradise, this perfect garden. He creates, he creates Adam and he places Adam in this, this wonderful garden. And he says, It's not good for man to be by himself. And all the women said, amen, right? I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals, all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still there was no helper, just right for Adam. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. It was probably the easiest work that God ever had to do. <laughs> While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. And what do you think Adam said? At last. Yes, 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 she is, she is right, right? So at the very beginning, we see, we see how God not only creates us in his image, his image that is communal in nature, right? He also says that it is not good for us to be alone. So no wonder, you and I, no wonder there, there is a longing that we have for community. There's a longing for us to belong. We, we have this desire, it's an innate desire within us to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. It comes from God. It comes from his image. It comes from how we were created. The third thing is this, is we were designed. We were designed for Christian community. He created us and designed us in such a way that we would have a desire for community. He, he desires that we belong to him, that we have a relationship with him. It's not about rules, right? It's, it's not about checking boxes. 
It's God's desire that we love him, that we have a relationship with him, that we have a relationship with with the the triune God, with God the Father, yes, that we love and adore him, with, with God the Son, yes, that we understand that he died for our sins and we want to become more like Jesus, but we also have this desire to be led, to be filled with the Holy Spirit that we truly have relationship with, with God three in one. Not only that, not only we have a relationship with him, but also that we belong to a bigger community of faith that we belong to a Christian community. I believe that this means for every one of us, it's my, I believe it, I've said it a hundred times. I believe that everyone needs to be connected in a local church. We all need to be connected in a local church, which is part of Big C Church, the big church. Uh, but a, a local church, right? So we can be connected. So, so we, we have a, a, a group of people that, that we can do life and share life with, that we can gather together. There is something about gathering together. I know it's not all just about what happens here for like three hours on Sunday morning or what might happen here on on Wednesdays. I I understand that there's more to it than that, that it's not just about this time and space that we occupy. But I do want to say that there is something, there is is something, uh, I want to say intangible, but I think it's tangible as well, that we experience by being a part of this by being a part of the local church. And I believe it's God's desire that we all are connected to a local church, that we're all connected to this body of believers, a body of faith. It's not just about new hope. I hope hope you don't hear that this morning. It is not just about new hope. We are one gathering. There are are many gatherings. In in our own community, we are connected with a larger larger church community. Not just in this county, but in our state, in our country, all across the world. We are connected to the the big C church. We're not called, and and what I mean by that, by being connected to to a local church, it's it's not just about coming and and listening to a sermon. It's not just about coming and and listening to some teaching. It's it's not just about coming and and participating in in 20 minutes or so of of worship. It's not just about coming and and serving in, in all different types of areas on a Sunday or a Wednesday that we were designed to belong. It's it's, it's deeper. There's more to it than than showing up. That we we were designed to belong to one another. We were designed to belong to one another in Christian community. And so you ask yourself, How's that possible, really? As, as crazy as some of us are, right? How does that work? How is it possible, truly, that, that a, that a, that a bunch, of, bunch of people like you, a bunch of people like me, not just from this county, but from surrounding counties and surrounding towns, how is it, how is it possible? How does that work? How can, how can they all come together and like be part of this unified group? Like that just doesn't make sense. How does all that work? Well, community works because of unity in Christ. Community works. This works. Church works. Being a part of God's family, being a part of the body, it works because of unity in Christ. 
because of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.21 says, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence, out of a, a, a holy fear of Jesus Christ. That's how it works. It works because we can gather together under one common goal. We can gather together in the name of Jesus Christ. We don't have to gather together in the name of the Chicago Bears, right? Because I, I doubt that everyone's going to agree on that. We come together because of Jesus Christ. Howard Macy, an author and professor from George Fox University, he, he wrote this, Christian community is simply sharing a common life in Christ. It moves us beyond the self-interested isolation of private lives and beyond the superficial social contacts that pass for Christian fellowship. The biblical idea of community challenges us instead to commit ourselves to life together as the people of God. I, I don't know if that connects with you, but to me, that is, that's beautiful, right? It's not, about, it's not about just getting together in a social gathering. It's, it's not just about getting together and, and, and eating some chicken wings and, 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 and watching some football on Sunday. It's, it's so much more than that. It is coming together in this common good with this common life that we all find in the person of Jesus Christ. Rick Warren, he's, he's famous for saying it and writing a book about it. And I believe that it's, it's so true that we are better together. You and I are better together. You look at the person to your left, the person to your right, you're better because of them. You look at the person in front of you, the person behind you, you are better because of them. It may not be the way that you planned it. It may not be the way that, that I designed it. It certainly wouldn't have been the way that I designed it. but it's God's plan and it's his design. And it's not perfect because we're not perfect. And, and it's messy because you and I are messy. But the thing is, is it's beautiful because God's beautiful and his plans and his will is beautiful. It's a beautiful mess. That's what Christian community is. That, that's, what, that's what gathering together is. That's what life groups are. They're a beautiful, stinking mess. And if you've been in one, if you're a part of one now, my guess is you, whether you said it or not, you're thinking, amen. That's right. Because it is a beautiful, stinking mess. But it's God's plan and it's his design. And it's what we're all called to. And lastly, lastly, I believe that without Christian community, there is no discipleship. Without Christian community, I believe that there is no discipleship. John 13, 35, Jesus told his disciples, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Let me say it another way. A mark, something that marks you as a disciple of Christ is how you love each other, how you treat the person to your left, the person to your right, how you treat the person in front of you and behind you. That's a mark. That, that, is a, that is tangible evidence for a watching world to see 
if you're a disciple of Christ, if you follow Jesus and how you love one another, how you do life together, how you share in community, how, how, you, how you are or aren't committed to a, 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 a body of faith, the family of God is testimony, living testimony, a living witness of how, how you do life together. It's a witness of your, your discipleship. Here's, here's the thing, we can read, we can study, we can pray, we can memorize scripture, we can do all those things as individuals, correct? I mean, we can, we can enjoy ourselves, we can enjoy nature, we can enjoy creation, we can enjoy all of that. None of those things are bad in and of themselves, But we ain't disciples if we ain't in Christian community. It's God's plan. It's, it's who he is. It's how he created us. Discipleship happens in one another. I want to wrap up with this. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. It's not going to be on your screen. If you want to grab your Bible and take a look at it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing passage of Scripture. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. If you want to use an electronic device, we have, uh, we're using the, the, the New Living Translation, so if you want to flip to that to follow word for word. But if you want to use the Bible in the seat back in front of you, that's fantastic as well. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church the body of Christ. Let me just stop right there for a second. M many in ministry share this as kind of a, a, a like a life verse, as a like this. This is this is my calling. This is what I'm I'm called to do, to equip, equip, the church, to equip God's people to do His work. His work doesn't get accomplished by one or two people. Doesn't happen. Won't happen. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue. We're not finished yet. We've got work to do. This will continue until we all, until we all, until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. I've not arrived yet. My guess is you've not arrived yet either. There is work to be done, ladies and gentlemen, body of Christ, church. We are called to do God's work. Verse 14, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. Instead, instead we will speak the truth in love. Not just a few, this is God's people, this is you, this is me, this is the church. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, growing in every way, not just in a few ways, not just in the ways we desire, but growing in every way more and more like Christ. Remember, what's a disciple? Becoming more like Jesus, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Remember, it's Jesus that, that this thing all works because of Christ, because of, of reverence for him, because of submitting to him. 
That's how this thing works. It's because of Jesus. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part, listen, as each part, not just a few, but as each part does its own special work. What is your work? What is it that God has called you to? What is it? What is his, his will for you? How do you fit perfectly in to this Christian community? As each part does its own special work, it helps, get this, it helps the other parts grow. Discipleship. You, you being taught, being encouraged, being challenged by others, by one another, and then you having the opportunity as well because you are part of this community. You disciple others, encourage and challenge stretch and grow them. It helps the other parts grow. That's why I believe the discipleship doesn't happen without Christian community so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love so that the world may know that you are my disciples. I believe it's fitting this morning. Didn't plan it this way, it's just how God works. I believe it's fitting this morning that we receive communion. That this morning is it was just planned this way. There's something beautiful about communion. Something beautiful about being able in community with one another to share in this sacred time. It's not alone. It's not for ourselves. It's to be shared. do that, we come together and we share in the bread and in the cup because that's why this works. Because of Jesus and because of what he did, because the price that he paid for me and for you. So this morning, if, if, you, if you would, as we receive the bread and the cup, I, I just ask that you, when you receive them, you, you head back to your seat and you take a few moments. 